Uh, you know, it's kind of funny. I was uh, talking to my wife the other day. <laughs> Such a rare occasion. But uh, we were discussing relationships. Big surprise. <laughs> and uh, the notion of personality came up. I discussed with her and I said, well, you know, what I do is I think of your position, you know, and I think of what you're going through and how you feel about it and what caused you to act or react in this way, you know. So I see it from your point of view, you know, and then I go and I come over here and I say, okay, and then I look at it from, you know, my point of view and I say, okay, this is what I saw and this is the way I feel and this is how I would deal with it. Then I kind of go, like, okay, you know, and then there's God in the middle, and I see it from God's point of view, and he's kind of looking down and saying from that point of view and that point of view, and, you know, I kind of see it, and then I kind of go, you know, well, okay, this person isn't in touch with their feelings, and that person, you know, is kind of like trying to make that person to understand something that that person couldn't understand because they haven't gotten to that place of understanding because they're still learning how to understand what it is that they don't understand in the first place. <laughs> so needless to say, within two sentences, I had lost my wife. <laughs> Oh, well, but it was interesting that she said uh, a comment. She said, you know, because we've had these discussions before, sometimes quietly, <laughs> sometimes heatedly, but always brought back to, you know, a certain perspective of truth and understanding and the American way you know, and God's way. But, and I am a, a Christian a lot longer than she is. But the point being is that she said something to me. She said, you know, you fascinate me. And I said, really, why? You know, because I always let a compliment. I'll take them wherever I can get them. <laughs> I'm a man. After all, I'll blow my ego up. I'll be perfectly happy. But um, she said to me that you think like a woman. And I said, okay. And is that bad? <laughs> you know, now you ladies are thinking, no, that's a great thing. She said, well, I've never met a man like you. She, you know, nobody thinks like you do. You're a weirdo. You know, I said, well, yeah, I'm a weirdo. <laughs> but um, I said, well, of course, the first time that she ever called me that or said, you know, you think like a woman, I said, well, you're the best man I know. <laughs> that didn't go over too well. But then I had a mother who was the best father I ever had because I had no father. And believe me, she wasn't much of a mother, but boy, was she a father. <laughs> She had a backhand. She was short. So anyways, the long and the short of it is, is that in a lot of ways, we all have tendencies and we all have strengths and weaknesses that God has brought us through by the circumstances of our life. You know, you may have been raised in a, a male-dominant society where, you know, thus saith the man, you know, or a southern sucks redneck society where, you know what, the woman's out back cooking, you know, and the man's sitting there chewing, you know, and shooting off his mouth and his brains, you know, kind of confusing the two with his gun because he can't blow anything off off the rail with his shotgun because he forgot where shells are. Well, anyways, that's a joke, by the way. Nothing against rednecks because, frankly, I think that the Indians had the rednecks down before the rednecks figured out that the rednecks really were Indians in the first place. But anyways, we won't do it. But the bottom line is all of our environment affects us in a certain way. You know, if you had a father, then he raised you a certain way and... You were influenced by that upbringing. And if you had a mother that was very affectionate, you were raised by that upbringing. Now, me, good question. Um, when I chose to become born again of the Spirit, that when I gave my life to Jesus, I didn't want to be who I was before. I wanted to be whatever he wanted me to be in order to minister to people. So I went through a lot of dramatic experiences that maybe chipped away my personality to become more like what he wanted me for a certain point in time. And I rejoice in that because it gives me an opportunity to look inside and see where other people are coming from. And so with my wife, you know, it's kind of unfair to her because, you know, being that I'm from the, you know, we were in touch with our feelings, emotional kind of generational kind of I, S, we, you, them, hippie kind of style thing. You know, Christianity, when peace, love, and joy came along, hey, we were right up there, man. We got peace. We got joy. You know, we're trying to get rid of the rock and roll. 
before we even added that. But once we got rid of the drugs, where, where, you know, and got the Holy Spirit instead, you know, we hippies really had kind of an advantage to seeing things maybe in a better way because we'd already kind of realized the futility of kind of the Zen Buddhisms or the Eastern Philosophicals Nirvanas or, you know, meditating on our belly buttons, you know, or seeing our navels for what they really were in the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> but we also were more open to what God was doing and who he was in some of the esoteric ways, ways that would involve heaven and not earth. You know, so we were pretty much really cool with that. Right? And a lot of times I think that's where people mistake, you know, what they are for what God is trying to make them into being. Because when we look at Jesus, we see a man who wasn't afraid to cry, he wasn't afraid to be himself, he was the embodiment of all emotion and all devotion to God. If God wanted him to be forceful, there was a time and place when he was. When he wanted him to be sensitive and tender, there was a time and a place for that. You see, it wasn't about compartmentalization or the id and the ego and the superego versus, you know, the realization of who you are versus what you think you are and where you are and how you are. No, it was what the Holy Spirit made him to be and how people perceived him because of that spirit of God that could cause two people to connect in a way that no one else would. So he could be right in the midst of a crowd and this woman that he touches who had a menstrual cycle that was going on, he could heal her and only him and her knew what was going on. And the crowd had no concept of it. That's the individuality of our God working in your life in a particularly peculiar way. And that's why you're a peculiar people. You're not meant to be a cookie cutter like someone else. You may sing in a different tenor or tone. <laughs> you may not be able to carry a tune. But if you can't, Sing anyways. So what? The harmonies will drown you out. Trust me, they'll hit every octave in a body of believers that there is. And if not, sit in front of me. I sing loud, so I'll drown you out. But the point being is that letting God do to you what he chooses to will create in you a joy of salvation. You'll be able to enjoy your life more, not because of prosperity, which some people seem to think that's the ultimate goal, but because of perspective. So I'll give you an example. One of my greatest joys right now in my life isn't my new camera. <laughs> I love the little kid. No, it's a, it's my Orbisphere, but you know, anyways, yeah, I bought one five years ago and now they made a new one. It's exactly the same except for the software. But anyways, the sound's not working because it's kind of like they messed with it and I can't quite get it. Whatever it is that it's doing, it's doing it, so oh well. But my greatest joy has been finding on this porch in the midst of this, sometimes it feels like confinement because of the way I am. I like to be out there on the road, you know, again, you know, I'm working and doing all kinds of things, you know. But in this time of being confined to the home and working on the internet and doing the ministry of the Lord, I get a chance to see this butterfly, butterfly. I get a chance to see this hummingbird. And you know, I really get a kick out of this guy. I mean, I am just blessed out of my mind every time I see this hummingbird, wherever he's going. It just blows my mind. Now, back in 74 when I got saved, it was a seagull. <laughs> Go figure. Then it was a pelican. And last goes an eagle. Although eagles aren't that exciting when you see them, like in Oregon, you know, standing around on the ground, you know, and you think, that's not exactly what I think of as regal. All these eagles wandering around in an open field on the ground. Not a pretty sight. It seems kind of wrong somehow. Everybody always pictures of like so high in the sky or up in a tree or whatever. But then I have seen, you know, with my own eyes, you know, an eagle dive down into the river and snatch a trout, you know, right out of the river and come splashing out, you know, leaping and, oh, oh, and take off. Spring Creek, Oregon, matter of fact, but God gave it to me as a vision. It was a real life experience, but it was 
envisioning for me the joy of seeing what God would allow me to know and remember for the rest of my life. And so now I have this hummingbird, and yeah, I just get a kick out of it. And my wife thinks that's just probably the most insane thing in the world. <laughs> no, I don't have a hummingbird feeder. We tried and we kept spilling it, and just somehow the hummingbird never got to it, so I gave up on that. But when he had flowers on this deck, he used to come once in a while, and whenever I was doing something really, I really neat, you know, on the computer, it was like he would come over and look in the window, you know, and man, it just blew my mind. I'd look over and there he was. So my idea was, wow, you know, I just think it would be so neat in the millennium or whatever. We go to heaven, you know, which is cool, you know, that's going to be a pretty soon. Then we come back on earth, you know, I just want, like, a bunch of hummingbirds around, you know, I just want to kind of like, talk to him, you know, kind of look at him, just dying around here in the world. I don't know, they just, they're pretty cool, you know. They're like my butterflies of the bird family. Think about it. <laughs> butterflies of the bird family. Hmm. What are you? Is God's will my will? This is the will of God, even your sanctification. It is not a question of whether God is willing to sanctify me. Is it my will that I be sanctified? Am I willing to let God do in me all that he has made possible by the atonement of his son? Am I willing to let Jesus be made sanctification to me? And to let the life of Jesus be manifested in my <clears throat> mortal flesh? Beware of saying, oh no, I'm longing to be sanctified. I want it. No, don't say that. You are not. Stop lying and make it a matter of transaction, a reality. Nothing in my hands I bring. Receive Jesus Christ to be made sanctification to you in implicit faith, and the great marvel of the atonement of Jesus will be made real in you. In other words, he will do it if you but ask. Ask and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find, knock, and the door will be opened. Because guess what? In the book of Revelation, Jesus is standing there at a door. And he ain't knocking for the unbeliever. He ain't knocking for the sinner. He ain't knocking for the saint. He's knocking at the door of a church. And he says, look, I'm standing on the outside, and the church is on the inside. And I don't know, but, you know, I think we got this picture wrong. So if you open the door, I'll come in. But unless you invite me, I can't even get in my own church. Think about it. All you got to do is open up and let him. Receive Jesus Christ to be made sanctification to you in implicit faith, and the great marvel of the atonement of Jesus will be made real in you. All that Jesus made possible is mine by the free loving gift of God on the ground of what he performed and what he did. It was his will that was accomplished, not yours. So his will can be done in you. My attitude as a saved and sanctified soul is that of a profound, humble holiness. There is no such thing as a proud holiness. A holiness based on agonizing repentance and a sense of unspeakable shame and degradation, and also of the amazing realization that the love of God commended itself to me in that while I cared nothing about him, he completed everything for my salvation and sanctification. He did it all for you, by you, in you, to you, and will accomplish it through you as you let him, as he does it to you anyways. Because guess what? Your circumstances are going to compress you into making you do it anyways. You can do it the easy way or the hard way. Or are you going to rebel and be cast away? Oops. Don't go on eternal salvation. Be careful. <laughs> you're saved, but how do you know until you get there? Good question. If you got there, you were saved. No wonder Paul says, nothing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, because he already did. Sanctification means that he makes me one with Jesus, and in Christ and him alone I am one with God. And it is not done through the superb, and it is done only through the superb atonement of Christ. Never put the effect of what Jesus has done as the cause. The effect in me is obedience and service and prayer in right relationship to him. 
and developing an interpersonal communication system whereby we talk to one another and we know each other. And is the outcome of speechless thanks and adoration for the marvelous work that was done in me because of what Jesus has done. Because he did it, there ain't much that you can add to it. So since you can't add to it, you might as well get on and do what he wants you to do, allowing him to become all in you, alive and well, and accomplishing his purposes rather than your own. Hey, you can live your life in your own way you want to, but one day you'll stand before Jesus and then you'll say, you mean, Lord, you didn't want me to do that? You didn't want me to cast out demons in your name? You didn't want me to raise the dead, heal the sick? You didn't want me to do all these marvelous works in your name? Depart from me, I never knew you. Whoa! Ooh, ooey, yikes. What do you mean you don't know me, Lord? I did it in your name. But did you know me? And better yet, did I ask you to? There's only one guarantee of salvation. Only one. And there's only one assurance. And that's what's become popular in these latter days in the fundamentalist Christianity and fundamentalist terminology that we say, if you have a relationship with Jesus, then you're assured of salvation. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're not assured. In 1 John, it's said a different way. If ye abide in me, my words abide in me, so be perfect. But it talks about abiding and that Jesus abides in you, lives in you. But the way that he lives in you is through a relationship to you as you yield your life and talk to you and ask him to be in your life daily, every day, today, tomorrow. Let tomorrow take care of yourself. Hey, you have enough problems today, don't you? But your relationship is assured and your salvation is a confident assurance that God will accomplish perfection in you if you just talk to Him. How hard can that be? All you got to do is ask. I think He's waiting. Did you talk to Him yet? I'm waiting. Okay. Are you going to talk to him? If not, the question is, do you really want to go to hell? Or, are you really that embarrassed? Are you really that humbled? Are you really that fearful to find out that you're God? Even the Son of God and the very Holy Spirit is that real. I got news for you. He is. Thank you.